Osama bin Laden, a well-known historical figure, was born on March 10, 1957. While his birthplace was once believed to be Jeddah in Western Arabia, it is now widely accepted that he was born in the Saudi capital, Riyadh. His father, Mohammed bin Awad bin Laden, was born in Yemen in 1908 and moved with his family to the red coast of Western Arabia, which later became part of Saudi Arabia. In the 1930s, Mohammed bin Awad bin Laden became a successful construction contractor, and his company, the Saudi bin Laden Group, was founded under the patronage of the royal family, working for the first ruler of Saudi Arabia, Abdulaziz ibn Saud. During the early years of Saudi Arabia's development as the world's largest oil exporter and a wealthy nation, the bin Laden family established themselves as an enormously successful and wealthy construction company. Osama's mother, Hamida Aladas, came from a family of successful citrus farmers in Syria and became Muhammad's 10th wife in 1956, when she was just 14 years old and he was a 48-year-old millionaire. Osama was born a year later and he was their only child. However, Muhammad and Hamida separated soon after, leading to speculation that they were never officially married and that Hamida was just a concubine. Despite this, Osama grew up in a privileged environment, as his father was a multi-millionaire, with a net worth that would have been in the billions if adjusted for inflation today. Osama bin Laden's parents divorced when he was young. After the divorce, his mother remarried Muhammad Aladas, a business associate of Muhammad bin Laden. Osama grew up with his mother and stepfather and several step-siblings. However, he was not estranged from his father. In fact, Muhammad bin Laden played a significant role in Osama's development by instilling in him much of his conservative religious fervor beginning in 1968. Osama bin Laden attended Al-Taqwa Model School in Jeddah. In 1971, he went to Oxford University in Britain to undertake an English language course. Despite his later reputation as a terrorist and extremist, Osama's younger years were relatively normal. He was a football fan who followed Arsenal Football Club and showed an interest in military history. There is no doubt that Osama bin Laden's background was far from ordinary. By the 1960s, the Saudi bin Laden group had become one of the most influential corporations in the Arab world. The company had extensive ties to the Saudi royal family, and it was even awarded the contracts to oversee the maintenance and repairs of the mosques in the two holiest cities in the Islamic world, Mecca and Medina in 1964. The company acquired the contract to record the exterior of the Dome of the Rock, the most important Muslim religious site in Jerusalem. By that time, the ties between Muhammad bin Laden and the Saudi royal family had become extremely extensive. However, in 1967, Muhammad was killed at 59 years of age in an airplane accident in Saudi Arabia when the pilot misjudged the plane's landing. Even though the death of Muhammad bin Laden was a setback, the Saudi bin Laden group thrived under the guidance of his sons from previous marriages. The company expanded and diversified its operations in the 1970s and 1980s and gained contracts worth billions of dollars in various parts of the Middle East. As Osama was still very young after his father's demise, he did not participate in the business affairs of the Saudi bin Laden group during those years. At the age of 19 in 1976, instead of joining the family business, Osama chose to pursue his education. He enrolled in the King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah to study economics and business administration, with the intention of taking up a role in the family business in the future. However, some who knew him reported that Osama's true passions lied in religion, poetry, and Arabic literature, indicating a potential shift away from business interests. Financially, Osama did not face any concerns as he was set to inherit over $30 million from his father's estate. At this time, he was already married to his first wife, Najwa Hanum, a Syrian woman and his first cousin from his mother's side. He had married her at the age of 17 in 1974. Najwa was the first of at least five wives he would have. Throughout his life, Osama had over two dozen children. The period of the mid to late 1970s played a crucial role in shaping his worldview and ideology, although the available evidence about this time is often incomplete and inconsistent. Despite this, it is clear that Osama started developing a pan-Islamist ideology from an early age. This movement calls for the unity of Muslims in all countries, promoting and defending their faith. Osama's pan-Islamist ideology draws inspiration from the Arab Caliphate, which controlled much of the Middle East, North Africa, and neighboring regions between the 8th and 11th centuries. This movement also emphasizes reducing or eliminating Western involvement in the Middle East, which had been under British and French domination since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. Meanwhile, the United States was increasingly showing interest in the region as British and French influence declined. 
Osama grew up in a Middle Eastern world that was undergoing significant changes. In summary, the state of Israel was frequently in conflict with its Muslim neighbors, especially in the Six-Day War of 1967 and the Yom Kippur War of 1973. During the 1970s, the writings of Sayyid, an Egyptian Islamic scholar and political theorist, had a significant impact on Islamic education across the Muslim world. Sayyid's writings argued that Islamic jihad or struggle against evil was justifiable for establishing a new Islamic caliphate and that Sharia law should be imposed across all Muslim states. His writings also contained a strong anti-Western sentiment, with the United States being denounced as materialistic and godless. Bin Laden's brother was a defining influence on his ideological beliefs during this period. Muhammad, who strongly supported his brother's beliefs, worked as a teacher at Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah during the late 1970s when Osama was a student there. According to Abdul Aziz, Osama completed his studies in 1979, but it's unclear if he obtained a degree. This time period was significant due to the ongoing turmoil in the Islamic world. The Iranian Revolution in 1978 led to the establishment of an Islamic state in Iran, while Afghanistan was experiencing political turmoil as the Marxist People's Democratic Party took control and established a socialist, non-religious state. The People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan PDP, had a long history of association with the Soviet Union, and Russia had always maintained an interest in Afghanistan since the mid-19th century when the country acted as a buffer state between Russia and the British presence in India and Pakistan. However, there is limited evidence to suggest that the Soviet Union played a significant role in the PDP's capture of power in Afghanistan in 1978. Despite not initially supporting the Marxist regime that took over Afghanistan in the late 1970s, they eventually formed a close relationship with the new government. However, when Islamist groups and other opponents of the ruling party started to revolt against them, the Marxist leaders turned to Moscow for assistance. Initially, only limited help was provided, but as the situation worsened, the Soviet Union eventually invaded Afghanistan in the last days of December 1979. In the beginning of 1980, the Soviet Union had deployed thousands of tanks and tens of thousands of troops to occupy the major cities of Afghanistan. Meanwhile, Osama bin Laden, who had just completed his studies at King Abdulaziz University, had already traveled to Pakistan even before the Soviet invasion took place. Pakistan has played a significant role in the movements of international jihadists during the 20th and early 21st centuries, and this continues to be the case today. Pakistan has claimed to be against the presence of Islamic fundamentalism within its borders. However, in reality, it has turned a blind eye to the issue for decades, largely due to its ongoing Cold War with Hindu-majority India. This conflict has been ongoing since the partition of British India in 1947, which split the territory along religious lines. After arriving in Pakistan in 1979, bin Laden's life was greatly influenced by the country for the next 30 years. He quickly became associated with Abdullah Azam, a Palestinian jihadist who had a significant impact on many of the prominent Islamic terrorists of the late 20th century. Azam then urged bin Laden to join the numerous Muslim men who were traveling to Afghanistan to fight against the godless Soviet invaders. The Mujahideen, which roughly translates to one who engages in holy war or jihad, were the individuals who were recruited and trained by bin Laden, using his inherited fortune in Pakistan in the early 1980s. These Mujahideen were then sent to Afghanistan to fight against the Soviet invaders in the mountainous regions. While bin Laden's financing for the Mujahideen was significant, it was much smaller compared to the billions of dollars that the United States and Saudi Arabian governments spent on equipping and training anti-Soviet forces in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. These forces were used as proxies to fight against the Soviet invasion. Although there have been some exaggerated claims about bin Laden being financed and trained by American agents during the 1980s, it is true that he did have some limited contacts with U.S. special forces in the region. The war that bin Laden joined in 1980 was similar to previous conflicts in Afghanistan, with the Soviets committing 80,000 troops to the region. By the end of 1980 and far superior weaponry, they were able to occupy and hold the main cities and prop up the Marxist PDP. But the Mujahideen groups of which there were more moderate and fundamentalist branches were largely in control of the regions outside of the city. The Hindu Kush mountains, which dominate much of the country, particularly in the east and north, are ideal territory for the waging of guerrilla warfare. During the 1980s Soviet-Afghan war, the fighting escalated and became extremely brutal. 
The Soviet forces resorted to indiscriminate bombing and destruction of rural villages in an attempt to eliminate the insurgents. As a result, the war caused massive displacement, with around 4 million people over a quarter of Afghanistan's population being displaced by the mid-1980s. Hundreds of thousands of these displaced people became refugees in Pakistan and Iran. The conflict in Afghanistan caused an enormous loss of life, with estimates ranging from at least half a million to potentially triple that number. It was often referred to as the Soviet Union's equivalent of the Vietnam War for the United States, as the Russians found themselves unable to defeat their enemy. During this time, Osama bin Laden was a significant figure in the Mujahideen movement in Afghanistan. Initially, he started by providing supplies to the combatants in Afghanistan and also aiding in the transportation of people who were interested in joining the fight against the Soviet Union. He traveled from his home country of Saudi Arabia to Pakistan, where they were trained and equipped before being sent to the northern region. Throughout this period, bin Laden moved back and forth between Pakistan and the Mujahideen's strongholds in the mountains of the Hindu Kush. In 1984, Osama bin Laden and his mentor, Abdullah Azam, founded a new organization called Maktada al Qaedamat. The group's main objective was to gather financial support from both the Arab world and the Western world to sustain the fight against the Soviet Union. The funds raised were then utilized to purchase weapons and provide training to the Mujahideen. As of 1986, hundreds of fighters had been trained by the network, and they were stationed in eastern Afghanistan at bin Laden's base, known as al Masada, also referred to as the Lion's Den. During the late spring and early summer of 1987, the Mujahideen launched an attack against the Soviet forces and the Marxist regime, and these attacks were led by bin Laden. Although the Battle of Jaji did not have much strategic significance in the larger context of the war, it greatly enhanced bin Laden's reputation among the Mujahideen and in the Arab world. This was partly due to the reports on the battle produced by a Saudi journalist named Jamal Khashoggi, who was associated with bin Laden, but had different political and religious views than him. Establishing the connection between Maktada and al-Qaeda was crucial during the 1980s, as it provided the foundation for the jihadist movement that bin Laden would later become known for. As the war in Afghanistan progressed, and the Soviet and Marxist forces faced certain defeat in the late 1980s, attention shifted towards the future of the organization. During the late 1980s, there was a disagreement among the members of Maktada al-Qaeda about the organization's future. While some members wanted to maintain a moderate stance and focus on fighting the Soviets, others such as bin Laden and Abdullah Azam had a more radical vision. They believed that Maktada al-Qaeda should transform into a larger organization that aimed to expel non-Arab powers from the Muslim world. This more extreme view led to the formation of a new organization in 1988 called al-Qaeda, meaning the base of the foundation, by bin Laden and the SSM. Over time, al-Qaeda grew to become the largest jihadist organization in the world, and it remains notorious for this today. One of its primary goals from the beginning was to launch holy war or jihad against non-Muslims in any part of the traditional Muslim world, including the Middle East, Lower Central Asia, the Maghreb and North Africa, and other peripheral regions such as Somalia, Mali, Nigeria, and Sub-Saharan Africa with Muslim populations. Al-Qaeda's ideological framework extended to Indonesia and beyond, with a strong emphasis on eliminating American influence from the Middle East and destroying Israel, which it saw as a Western stronghold in the Levant. As time went on, the group believed that inciting a major war against the United States was necessary to radicalize the Muslim world against non-Muslims. However, the organization was not able to engage in outright conflict initially, so it relied on terrorist tactics during its early years. In addition to its goals of eliminating American influence and destroying Israel, al-Qaeda also viewed moderate Muslims as having strayed from traditional Islam, and it sought to establish a strict form of Islamic rule based on Sharia law and a literal interpretation of the Quran across the Muslim world. By the time al-Qaeda was founded in 1988, the war in Afghanistan was already winding down. After Mikhail Gorbachev became the leader of the Soviet Union in 1985, he publicly declared his intention to end Soviet involvement in the country. Similar to how it took the United States several years to fully withdraw from Vietnam, the Soviet Union was unable to pull out of Afghanistan immediately. In fact, there was a substantial increase in the number of Soviet troops deployed to Afghanistan in the short term, as Moscow tried to win the war quickly through a surge in troop numbers. However, this strategy was unsuccessful, and the Reagan administration continued to provide significant military and financial aid to the Mujahideen, resulting in prolonged conflict. 
the Mujahideen's guerrilla war gained unparalleled success against the Soviet forces once they were armed with Stinger missiles capable of shooting down helicopters. This eventually led to peace agreements being signed by the Afghan government, the Soviet Union, the US, and Pakistan in 1988, and the last Soviet troops were withdrawn in 1989. In the years that followed, the Marxist regime continued to lose significant ground to the Mujahideen groups, ultimately resulting in its collapse in 1992. Once the communist regime was removed, the various Mujahideen groups turned on each other, resulting in years of civil war. In 1996, a group known as the Taliban emerged victorious, although they never gained full control of the country. The Northern Alliance held much of the North until the late 1990s and early 2000s. After the Soviet-Afghan War, bin Laden returned to his home country, Saudi Arabia, in 1989, where he was welcomed as a hero for his role in ousting the Russians from Afghanistan. He started working with the Saudi bin Laden group, his father's business, in order to utilize its economic power and business connections to expand al-Qaeda. Following his return to Saudi Arabia in 1989, bin Laden sought to use his family's business connections to support al-Qaeda's growth. He also met with other prominent figures in the Islamic jihadist movement across the Middle East, including Egypt. However, relations between bin Laden and the Saudi government became strained as he pursued increasingly confrontational actions against non-Muslims, while the Saudi government aimed to maintain their strong relationship with the United States. This issue was related to the presence of U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia following the Gulf War in 1991. Bin Laden strongly opposed the presence of non-Muslim military forces on the Arabian Peninsula, viewing it as an affront to the holy sites of Islam. He began to publicly criticize the Saudi government for allowing such an occupation to take place and called for the expulsion of all American forces from the region. This led to increasing tension between bin Laden and the Saudi government, which eventually revoked his citizenship in 1994 and expelled him from the country. In August 1990, Iraq's dictator, Saddam Hussein, launched a surprise invasion of Kuwait, a small, oil-rich country that was heavily indebted to many countries, including Iraq, as it had borrowed money to fund its war with Iran in the 1980s. The invasion sent shockwaves through the region, and the international community swiftly responded, imposing economic sanctions on Iraq and calling for the immediate withdrawal of Iraqi forces from Kuwait. The swift invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein in August 1990 caused a global outcry, prompting the United States to form a coalition of allies to launch a counterattack against Iraq. This coalition included not only Western powers such as Britain, France, and Germany, but also several Arab and Muslim nations, most notably Egypt, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. The coalition was established with the aim of driving Iraqi forces out of Kuwait and restoring the independence of the small Gulf state. As the situation escalated, American troops started arriving in the Middle East in the fall of 1990 to prepare for a potential military intervention. Saudi Arabia was the main staging ground for the coalition forces, which aimed to liberate Kuwait and launch an attack on Iraq. However, negotiations for a peaceful settlement continued to be pursued. When those efforts failed, the U.S.-led coalition began Operation Desert Storm on January 16, 1991, which aimed to remove Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Bin Laden was strongly opposed to the presence of American troops in Saudi Arabia and believed that it was a violation of Islam. He saw it as an infringement on the sovereignty of Saudi Arabia and a betrayal of the Muslim world. Bin Laden's request to King Fahd was not accepted and the deployment of U.S. troops to Saudi Arabia proceeded as planned. This further fueled Bin Laden's animosity towards the Saudi government and the United States. After King Fahd rejected bin Laden's offer to use his own Arab legion to defend the Saudi border against any Iraqi incursion, the U.S. and coalition troop buildup in Saudi Arabia continued to increase. This led to bin Laden publicly denouncing the Saudi government and accusing them of allowing Western infidels into the kingdom, which he claimed was the protector of Islam's holiest sites, Mecca and Medina. Bin Laden also tried to persuade the senior Saudi religious scholars to issue a religious decree condemning the American incursion, but his efforts were unsuccessful. As a result of all these actions, the relationship between Bin Laden and the Saudi government deteriorated, and he was expelled from the country in 1991. The U.S.-led Operation Desert Storm successfully defeated Iraq and liberated Kuwait in the spring of 1991. After being expelled from Saudi Arabia in 1991, Osama bin Laden moved to Sudan in 1992. Sudan was under the rule of Colonel Omar al-Bashir, who had seized power in a military coup in 1989 and implemented Sharia law in the country. 
Bin Laden was invited to Sudan by Hassan al-Tarabi, the speaker of the Sudanese National Assembly and the second most powerful figure in Sudan after al-Bashir. Bin Laden was given free reign in Sudan and established his own compound with his followers within al-Qaeda, which was defended with advanced weaponry. He also established new training bases for Mujahideen near the capital of Khartoum and had a manor in the city. During bin Laden's stay in Sudan from 1992 to 1996, the U.S. began closely monitoring his activities and the activities of al-Qaeda, as Sudan was designated as a state sponsor of international terrorism. The U.S. conducted flyovers of bin Laden's compound and gathered other forms of intelligence. Additionally, U.S. sanctions against Sudan for harboring bin Laden and other Islamic fundamentalists and terrorists had a significant impact on the country's economy. By 1996, Sudan's president, Omar al-Bashir, had weakened bin Laden's primary supporter, Hassan al-Tarabi, and made it clear that Sudan was no longer a safe haven for him. After his expulsion from Sudan, bin Laden returned to Afghanistan, where the Taliban had recently gained control. Mullah Muhammad Omar, the leader of the Taliban government, welcomed bin Laden as his personal guest. In August 1996, bin Laden issued a declaration of war against the United States, claiming that the U.S. had occupied Saudi Arabia since 1990 and was the primary supporter of Israel in the region. There is speculation that bin Laden's expulsion from Sudan and the loss of much of his family's wealth contributed to his radicalization and his decision to declare war against the U.S. Additionally, the U.S. sanctions against Sudan may have pressured the Sudanese government into expelling bin Laden and pushed him towards his all-out war against the U.S. Bin Laden and al-Qaeda had a long-standing commitment to carrying out terrorist actions, particularly against the United States. This had been a part of their strategy since as early as 1990, when the Federal Bureau of Investigation discovered plans to blow up skyscrapers in New York City at the home of al-Qaeda affiliate al Said Nasser in New Jersey. In 1993, Ramzi Youssef, another known al-Qaeda affiliate who had trained in their camps in Afghanistan, led a truck bombing outside the North Tower of the World Trade Center in Manhattan. Bin Laden had financed and organized the bombing of the Goldmore Hotel in Aden, Yemen, in 1992. These were just some of the many terrorist actions planned and carried out by al-Qaeda, with the goal of confronting the United States. The attacks in August 1998 were highly sophisticated and targeted the U.S. embassies in the capitals of Tanzania and Kenya. The bombings were carried out simultaneously using truck bombs, leaving no doubt that the United States was the intended target. The coordinated terrorist attacks killed over 200 people and injured thousands more, including many local residents. Al-Qaeda claimed responsibility for the bombings, and they marked a significant escalation in the group's use of terrorist tactics against the United States and its interests. The bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam marked a turning point in the history of terrorism, as they were some of the deadliest attacks on American targets prior to the September 11 attacks. The attacks also revealed the sophistication of al-Qaeda's planning and the level of coordination between its operatives across multiple countries. In addition to the loss of lives, the bombings caused significant damage to the U.S. embassies and created a sense of vulnerability and insecurity among Americans and other Westerners living and working in Africa. The attacks prompted the U.S. to launch missile strikes on al-Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan and Sudan in August 1998. However, the strikes failed to kill bin Laden and his top lieutenants, and instead, they went into hiding in remote areas of Afghanistan. The U.S. also intensified its efforts to track down and arrest al-Qaeda operatives around the world, and many were eventually captured or killed in the years leading up to the September 11 attacks. This attack, of course, would take place on September 11, 2001, when al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked four commercial airplanes and flew them into the World Trade Center towers in New York City and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. Another plane was also hijacked but crashed in a field in Pennsylvania after passengers attempted to overpower the hijackers. The 9-11's attacks resulted in the deaths of nearly 3,000 people and caused significant damage to the United States' economic and political infrastructure. The attacks were a turning point in U.S. history and sparked a global war on terrorism. The plan was for the terrorists to hijack multiple commercial airliners and crash them into high-profile targets, including the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and possibly the White House or the Capitol Building. Training for the attack began in 2000, with the hijackers using flight simulators to practice flying large planes. The terrorists also received weapons training and learned how to take over a plane using box cutters as weapons. On September 11, 2001, the terrorists carried out their plan. 
Two planes crashed into the twin towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, causing both towers to collapse and killing nearly 3,000 people. Despite the increased security measures in the United States after 9-11, bin Laden and his organization continued to plan and carry out terrorist activities in the wider Muslim world, targeting Western interests in the Middle East, which had become more vulnerable since the American-led invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. This occupation would continue for the next two decades. After the invasion of Afghanistan and the defeat of the Taliban, the U.S. under President George W. Bush expressed its intention to continue with its policy of regime change in the Middle East, targeting states that it considered supporters of terrorism. The regime of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, which had survived the Gulf War, was one of the main targets. The U.S. administration made it clear that Iraq was a priority and that it was planning to remove Saddam Hussein from power. The U.S. policy of regime change in the Middle East, which began with the invasion of Afghanistan, continued with the targeting of Iraq and Saddam Hussein's regime. However, this policy was met with less support from America's allies, with some, like France, arguing that it was driven by the desire for control over oil-producing countries and neo-imperialism in the region, rather than counter-terrorism efforts. Despite these objections, the U.S. and its allies, including Britain, launched an invasion of Iraq in March 2003, justifying it by claiming that Hussein's regime was attempting to acquire weapons of mass destruction and had ties to bin Laden's al-Qaeda. Bin Laden had previously criticized the U.S. for imposing crippling economic sanctions on Iraq after the Gulf War, and this was one of his reasons for targeting America. The invasion of Iraq, based on the premise of weapons of mass destruction and alleged links to bin Laden and al-Qaeda, did not have any concrete evidence to support these claims. The quick victory over the Ba'athist regime was announced by President Bush in just two months. However, the aftermath was anything but peaceful. A counterinsurgency campaign began in 2003, leading to years of violence as various groups tried to push out the U.S. forces. Bin Laden and al-Qaeda took advantage of the situation by trying to create a divide between the Sunni and Shiite communities, hoping to incite a civil war across Iraq. Despite the stabilization of the war in Iraq in the late 2000s, al-Qaeda persisted in their campaign and received support from bin Laden in Pakistan. In March 2008, he authorized bombings in Baghdad and a suicide bombing on the Shiite Imam Hussein Shrine in Karbala, which killed 42 people and injured dozens more. While the American troop surge and political reforms helped to quell much of the violence in Iraq, al-Qaeda's campaign continued, highlighting the ongoing threat posed by the group and its leader. After moving to Pakistan, bin Laden had a new compound built in the city of Abbottabad. It was constructed shortly after his arrival in 2002 and completed in 2005. The estate was spread over 38,000 square feet and was surrounded by a high concrete perimeter fence topped with barbed wire. The property had few windows and many screens to block the view of the interior, including a screen on the third floor balcony to ensure privacy for bin Laden, who was quite tall at 6 feet and 4 inches. The compound was clearly designed with security in mind, and it is hard to believe that the authorities could have failed to notice its unusual features. It is believed that bin Laden lived in the compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, with some of his family members and supporters from 2006 onward. However, his reliance on the compound ultimately led to his downfall. U.S. intelligence agencies discovered in 2009 that a trusted courier named Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, who had been with bin Laden during the Battle of Tora Bora in 2001, was working for him as a messenger while he was in hiding in Pakistan. In May 2011, after months of planning, a team of U.S. Navy SEALs launched a daring raid on the compound. The operation, dubbed Operation Neptune Spear, involved the use of stealth helicopters and was carried out under the cover of darkness. The SEALs encountered resistance from bin Laden and his followers, but after a firefight, they were able to kill the al-Qaeda leader and several of his associates. The news of bin Laden's death was met with widespread celebration in the U.S., but it also triggered a wave of reprisal attacks by al-Qaeda and other extremist groups. In the years since his death, the organization has continued to carry out attacks around the world, although it has been significantly weakened by a sustained global effort to dismantle its infrastructure and disrupt its operations. The death of bin Laden was a significant milestone in this effort, but it also served as a reminder of the continuing threat posed by international terrorism. Despite the initial resistance, the SEALs quickly cleared the compound, moving room to room, and found bin Laden and his family on the upper floor. A SEAL team member shot bin Laden in the head and chest, killing him instantly. 
The operation was over in less than 40 minutes, and the SEALs returned to Afghanistan with bin Laden's body, as well as a trove of intelligence materials. President Obama announced a successful operation in a televised address to the nation on May 2, 2011, stating that justice has been done. The death of bin Laden was a significant milestone in the global war on terrorism, as he had been the most wanted terrorist in the world for over a decade. It also provided a measure of closure for the families of the victims of the 9-11 attacks and the thousands of others who lost their lives in the subsequent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. After confirming that the person they had just killed was indeed bin Laden, the Navy SEALs collected valuable intelligence from the compound, including computers, hard drives, and other materials. They also blew up the crashed helicopter to prevent any sensitive technology from being obtained by others. The news of bin Laden's death was announced by President Obama in a televised address to the nation on May 1, 2011. The announcement was met with widespread jubilation in the United States, as it was seen as a major victory in the fight against terrorism. However, the operation was not without controversy, particularly in Pakistan, where it was seen as a violation of their sovereignty. There were also concerns about the legality of the operation and the use of deadly force, as well as questions about the accuracy of the intelligence used to locate bin Laden. Despite these concerns, the operation was widely seen as a success and a significant blow to al-Qaeda. The body of bin Laden was flown back to Afghanistan for identification and then taken to the USS Carl Vinson, an aircraft carrier stationed in the North Arabian Sea. The US government decided to bury bin Laden's body at sea within 24 hours of his death, in accordance with Islamic tradition. A Muslim cleric conducted the appropriate funeral rites aboard the carrier before bin Laden's body was placed in a weighted bag and lowered into the Arabian Sea. The death of bin Laden was celebrated by many Americans, who saw it as a significant victory in the war on terror. It was also a significant moment in the history of al-Qaeda and Islamic terrorism, as bin Laden had been the face of the organization for over a decade, and his death marked a major blow to the group's leadership and morale and many other countries also increased their counter-terrorism efforts. Bin Laden was hunted by the U.S. for years, and in 2011, he was finally located and killed by U.S. special forces in Pakistan. While there are some who speculate that the date was chosen for this reason, there is no concrete evidence to support this theory. In any case, the attacks on 9-11s were carried out with precision and devastating effect.